Hello everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Forgotten Film Channel. Today's Forgotten Film Star is Max Baer Jr. Max Baer Jr. was born on December the 4th, 1937 in Oakland, California. His father was boxing great champion Max Baer. He attended school at the Christian Brothers High School and he was a total jock. He had four letters on his jersey. After high school, he attended Santa Clara University and received a bachelor degree in business administration. In the year 1960, he started finding work on television shows, and he really started out on the right foot. In between the years of 1960 and 1962, he had 14 appearances on nine different shows. In 1962, he drove his roommate to an audition. And when they got there, he decided that he was going to audition for the part as well. Now, this audition consisted of not saying a word, just kind of running around a room, chasing a pretend bird around. Now, after the audition, he was offered the role of Jethro Bodine on the show of the Beverly Hillbillies, a role which he accepted and he played for 273 of the 274 episodes during the show's nine-year run. While the show was still on the air, he appeared on a few game shows, talk shows, and made some celebrity appearances, including winning the 1968 San Diego Golf Tournament. In 1966, he got married to Kathleen Hill. They divorced in 1971, which was the same year that the Beverly Hillbillies was canceled. After the show ended, he had every intention of continuing his career as an actor, but sadly, he was a victim of typecasting. He couldn't get a job to save his life. All people saw when they looked at him was Jethro. Oh, in 1974, he and his friend Richard Compton were just kind of bullshitting around, and they wrote a movie. It was called Macon County Line. Max produced it and starred in it, with Richard directing it. They were able to make the whole film for $110,000. It grossed $25 million at the box office. It was the largest grossing independent film up until the mid-1990s. He did the same thing, producing and directing and starring in another film. And then in 1976, he bought the rights to the Bobby Gentry song, Ode to Billy Joe. With the words to that song, he comprised a story about it, wrote a movie, produced it. It starred Robbie Benson. It was a huge hit. It was the very first movie that was based on a song that was already a hit. In 1979, he retired, and he refused to reprise his role as Jethro in the 1981 Beverly Hillbillies movie. But 10 years later, in 1991, he was able to secure the rights for beverage and food licensing from the Beverly Hillbillies. In 1993, he played the role of Jethro one last time, that was for the made-for-TV movie, Legend of the Beverly Hillbillies. In 1999, he used that licensing that he had acquired to create 65 Beverly Hillbilly slot machines. He had those put in 11 casinos around Vegas. I'm sure he made a ton of money off of them. From the years 2000 through 2012, he tried to create a Beverly Hillbillies themed casino, hotel, restaurant type complex. Sadly, that never came into fruition. And now here we are in 2022. Max Bear is still alive, looking good at 83 years old. During his short career in the entertainment industry, he made 293 appearances on 22 different television shows, 
That includes his 273 episodes of The Hillbillies. He wrote and produced four movies starring in two of them. And in addition to that, he made 21 other appearances as either a game show contestant or a talk show participant. And what we have for you today is Max Baer Jr. playing Jethro in the Beverly Hillbillies, Season 1, Episode 4. I want to thank you for tuning into the Forgotten Film Channel. Have a great today. Hopefully tomorrow will be even better. still here, Grim. What's that? Drysdale Place is downwind. The smell of your corn liquor or brewing is gonna drive poor Miss Drysdale right out of her mind. <laughs> She's a drinking woman. <laughs> How do you know, Uncle Jay? Well, he kind of let it slip out. Remember when we was unloading this from the truck? Yeah. He says to me, uh, what's that? I said, uh, that's still for making corn liquor. He turned kind of white and trembly, and he says, Oh, please, don't ever let my wife see that. I reckon she just can't leave the stuff alone. Some folks like that. Terrible. Come to think of it, that's how come she's in Boston. What kind of drinking? Yeah. Miss Hathaway says she goes all over every place looking to get cured. Damn city cured. No good. The minute you go to take that away from them, they want it all the more. I could cure Mrs. Drysdale of her drinking in two days. Oh, huh, Granny? I just tell her she could have all she wanted. When they find out you don't care if they drink, they don't care to drink. That sure would be a blessing. Uh, over here, Ellie, now. Don't want to talk about drinking. Hey, look, everybody. Ella May's wearing a dress. Oh, Mr. Drysdale's in the house to see you. All right. My, my, ain't she pretty? Yeah. But, Ellie... You're showing too much bare hot. Well, that ain't her fault, Granny. She just got the dress on backwards. Ellie, honey, put it on the other way around. All right. Hold it. Hold on. <laughs> the world kind of a dress is that? Well, Miss Hathaway says a California sun dress. Wouldn't let no son of mine wear it. My daughter neither. Granny, you'd best get her into something decent whilst I talk to Mr. Drydale. Uncle Jay, can I go swimming in the cement pond? I reckon so, Jethro. But this ain't like the swimming hole back home. You can't go in there without no clothes on. I can't? No, sir. Okay, Uncle Jack. <laughs> Someday I gotta have a long talk with that boy. Drysdale's office, Mrs. Hathaway speaking. Boston. That must be Mrs. Drysdale. No, don't put her on. She'll only make my life Mrs. Drysdale. How are you? How are things in Boston? Oh, the doctors here are just as silly as the ones in Beverly Hills. They insist there's nothing wrong with me. They've got me so depressed. I just had to call and talk to my darling. Are you taking good care of him? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, he's stretched out on the sofa right now, having his nap. How sweet. Well, the moment he wakens, you take his temperature and give him some of that blue medicine. What? He's waking now? Oh, marvelous. Put him on. Tell him Mumsy wants to hear his sweet voice. <laughs> Speak to your Mumsy. <laughs> 
be whined. Oh, he probably has a migraine. Oh, poor Richard oh. Even made a hypochondriac out of you. Oh. Any message for Mr. Drysdale? Who? Oh, Mildred, my husband. Yes, well, uh, is he there? No, he's up at the Clampett estate. Clampett. They bought the place next to yours just about the time you left for Boston. I don't find them listed in the first families. You tell Milburn not to mingle with them socially until I've had a genealogical check run on them. We don't want riffraff living under our very noses. For pain, one swallower. Don't open near fire. I'll be right in, Mr. Johnsdale. Thank you, Willie May. Granny, this is quite an array of medicines you have here. Yep, them's all the remedies I made myself. Mm, I wish you'd make something to help my wife. She's a terrible hypochondriac. Oh, what's a hypochondriac? You run along now. I'll join you directly. There yeah, she goes from doctor to doctor to doctor. Well, I reckon the doctor can't help what's ailing her. Of course they can. It's psychosomatic. But she insists on prescriptions. Oh, I wish you could see our bedroom. Bottles all over the place. Mm. I plead with her. I hide the stuff. She always finds it or gets more. You think that's a lot of bottles? You should see my wife after a trip to the pharmacy. Why, she's so loaded, she can hardly stagger up the stairs. Sit down, Mr. Drysdale. Set yourself. And, and she has a dog. A perfectly healthy poodle. Now, would you believe that she... Don't tell me. Laps it up just like she does. Lord, love. You're sure toting a heavy burden. Now, maybe I can help you. Now, if she was to think that every time that she was to... You can just wear that barrel till your clothes get drier. What happened to Jethro? Did he get too close to a skunk? I uh, jumped in the pond with his clothes on. <laughs> Mr. Drysdale, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Did Granny uh, tell you about her complaints about the kitchen? Jed, I'm ashamed to mention my piddling troubles to a man bowed down with the misery he's got. <laughs> you know his wife. <laughs> Mr. Drysdale, our hearts go out to you. And we're going to help you, ain't we, Jeff? You bet you we are. Man serves a poor purpose in this world if he can't help his neighbor. Oh, you're very kind, but I'll manage. I've been living with it for years. Have a nip, it'll brace you up. Oh, no, thank you. I, I never touch it. You hear that, Jed? Poor man. He's got all the trouble and... None of the fun. <laughs> there goes a soft-hearted woman. Yeah. Now, about her complaints. Oh, yeah. Well, for one thing, that electric meat grinder has been giving Granny a heap of trouble. Electric meat grinder? Yeah, this one right here in the dish trough. Oh, it grinds the meat all right, but then you can't find it. It goes down that pipe. <laughs> lost two squirrels and a rabbit in that thing. <laughs> That's a disposal. You only put things in there that you don't want. Now, Mr. Drysdale, that ain't altogether true. Granny sure wanted them squirrels and that rabbit. <laughs> Another thing, this here sideways pump don't work at all. We must have carried in a barrel of water to prime that thing, but it doesn't work. Oh, there's another thing. Every once in a while, this little thing in the jig here makes a ringing noise like that. There it goes again. Well, that's a telephone. Someone's calling you. I don't hear them. They're calling you on the telephone. Say hello into it. Hello? Oh. I have to lift the receiver first. Now say it. Hello? Mr. Clabber? You said my name? Can they see through this thing? No. Mr. Clabber, may I please speak to Mr. Drysdale? Well, I sure can see, or else how would they know you're standing here? That's my second. She knows I'm here. Yes, Miss Hathaway. Mr. Drysdale, I have some messages. But I'll be doggone. <laughs> Granny! Hey, me! Come look what we got! <laughs> the carpets of justice covered the telephone. <laughs> Indeed, this is a marvelous invention. With this instrument, you can talk to anyone any place in the civilized world. We talk to my cousin, Pearl? Oh, yes, of course. Right now? Yes. Ellie Mee. 
Run out back and fetch Jethro. Well, wait a minute. He might not have his clothes on yet. Oh, I'll get him. Dad, is he greening us? Can we honest to goodness talk to Pearl on this day? You heard what he said. Hello, Pearl, you old rascal. What you doing back there? Hi, Larry. How's this here, Bill? Come on, ladies. First, you gotta pick this thing up. Hello, Pearl, you old rascal. What you doing back there? In a word, you just humming. Jane ain't humming a tune. Uh, shut up, humming, and say something. Jeff will be right in. You ready to call Pearl? You've been a calm, but she just hummed. <laughs> That's a dial tone. First, you've got to dial long distance like this. Okay. Howdy, Pearl. Hello, Pearl, you old rascal. What you doing back there? Come on, there ain't Pearl. This is long distance. Know that, Pearl. Oh, I, I believe you have the operator. What's Pearl's number? Number? Operator. Oh, just a moment, please. Hey, folks, Mr. Drysdale told me what y'all was up to. You can't talk to Ma on that thing. Well, look who's getting too smart for his britches. Too big for him, too. Mr. Drysdale says we can talk to her. Yeah, you think you know more, Mr. Drysdale? Well, I know mine got no telephone. <laughs> Excuse me, Paul, operator. You sure saw things, and who asked you to butt in? I'll get it. I know what to do when it does that. Hello? Yeah, he's here. Well, for goodness sake. Well, sure. Well, howdy there, Miss Drysdale. This here is yours. Oh. <laughs> Margaret. Oh, how wonderful. Man? Oh, oh, yes, the telephone man. Yes. Well, how are you? I'm worried. That's how I am. I'm afraid, Milburn, that you've let the wrong kind of people move in next door to us, and I'm dreadfully, dreadfully upset. Now, dear, you mustn't let yourself get into this condition. <laughs> Control yourself. No, no, dear, you mustn't come home yet. No. Not until we get them in shape. I mean, get you in shape. Well, you know, I will wait until you're cute. Melbourne, I want to meet the Clampets as soon as possible. Now, when will that be? What about Christmas? <laughs> Next year. Melbourne, this conversation is making less and less sense. Now, I want the truth about the Clampets, or I'm flying home immediately. Now, Margaret, please control yourself. I, I don't want you flying. <laughs> no, please, dear, please, stay on the ground. <laughs> dear, why don't you lie down and take a sedative? And I'll call you from the office. All right. Goodbye. I'm sorry, my wife. We understand. <laughs> well, I'll... Keep your chin up. Oh, man. Don't it just tear your heart out? He is so ashamed of his wife, he don't even want us to meet her. What he says, she won't be cured till Christmas. Of next year. Are you gonna help me, Granny? I still say I could cure Mrs. Drysdale in two days. Sure be worth a try. If we could get her out here. Kid, misery loves company. And if that poor, miserable woman thought that she had a drinking friend living next door. Granny, you ain't ever down more than a thimbleful in your whole life. I know, Jed. But it'd be worth a little white lie to help a neighbor and save a marriage. But how? Hello, Pearl. Hello, Pearl. Hello, Pearl. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Get a stroke of luck, Granny. It's Mrs. Drysdale again. <laughs> well, no, ma'am, he ain't here, Mrs. Drysdale, but Granny and me'd like to talk to you. We your next door neighbors, the Clampets. <laughs> Listen, honey, I got my steel set up not 50 feet from your back door. Now you come on home, and you and me will get glassy eyed, fallen down crocked. <laughs> we'll get juiced at eyeballs. <laughs> Me neither.
your call. She's on a jet, all right? Never mind the grisly details. Oh, I am ruined. If Margaret gets one look at those hillbillies next door, she'll leave me. Get my psychiatrist over here. Move over, Claude. I need this more than you do. I know you don't need your psychiatrist. You're looking at the dark side. There is a bright side. Of course. Your wife is an intelligent woman. She'll see that underneath that rough exterior, the climates are basically fine people. Or she may even help them to get socially acclimated. You're right. I don't need my psychiatrist. Hmm. You do. Your wife will take my wife, through whose aristocratic veins flows blood the color of blueing, considers anyone whose ancestors did not arrive on the Mayflower immigrants. Yes, she does make rather a fetish at the family tree, but... But nothing. I'm stuck. Now, I'm either going to lose my wife or my largest depositor. That's what makes the whole thing so difficult. You know, I like the Clarence, but I love my wife. Isn't life weird? She's a snob, she's hypochondriac, she's not young and beautiful, but I love her. And now I do need my psychiatrist. <laughs> now, Mr. Drysdale, as we used to say at Vassar, que tu devia tu aclarecet, courage will light your path. Yes, I know what I have to do. I'll go to the airport. I'll take Margaret in my arms. I'll look her in the eye and lie like a rug. <laughs> Clampets have left town and put her back on the plane. I beseech you, do not become a mess in a web of lies. But it won't be a lie if the Clampets are tricked into actually leaving town. But they're just getting settled. What could possibly induce them to leave town? That's your problem. Me? You expect me? But they like you. Finagle them into going to Palm Springs for a few days. Hmm? No, no. I will not help you spin your deceitful web. Miss Hathaway, would you rather be an unemployed secretary or a spider with a ray? <laughs> You know, I think the Clampets might enjoy Palm Springs. <laughs> Palm Springs? Where is that? It's about 125 miles from here. In the desert. Desert? Yeah, remember we crossed on them on the way out here. All that sand? Yeah, I remember. You ain't getting me to no desert. Trees were so far apart, the woodpeckers had to tote lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but this is different, Granny. This is a beautiful resort with lots of trees and fine hotels and swimming pools. You got a pond for swimming right there. Ellie's out swimming right now. You didn't jump in with her clothes on, did you? I don't know. Oh, surely not. She promised to wear the lovely swim ensemble I got her. Yeah, she done just like Jethro. Here she comes with the dress shrunk clear up to her. <laughs> Granny! What's the matter? All her hair come out. What? It's true. Ellie lost her beautiful hair. Captain, <laughs> help her. She's bald as an eagle. Wait a minute. Take off your bathing cap. Oh, praise be. <laughs> All right, but Ellie, you hadn't ought to went swimming with your clothes on and shrunk up that nice dress. It's not a dress, is it, Miss Jane? No, dear. It's a beach jacket to wear over a bathing suit. Ellie may clamp it. Cover up your nakedness, child. <laughs> That's the way everyone goes swimming out here. It's perfectly proper. Well, you wouldn't catch me in nothing like that. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> Mr. Clampett. How would you like for a member of your family to become Princess of Palm Springs? What? They're holding a beauty contest at the Springs this week, and someone in this very room has the face and the figure to win. When the judges see her in a bathing suit... I yeah. told you, I ain't putting on no bathing suit. <laughs> Believe me, Mr. Clavett, this beautiful daughter of yours can win that Palm Springs beauty contest without even trying. Can we go, Pa? I'm sorry, Ellie Mae, but I just don't cotton to the notion of a bunch of strangers gawking at your bare limbs. Besides, we already know you're the prettiest. Why shame all them other girls? Run along, get some clothes on. Yes, sir, Pa. Mr. Clavett, I, I do wish you would reconsider about going to Palm Springs. Even if Ellie Uncle doesn't... Uncle Jay, Duke, and... Howdy, Miss Hathaway. Jane to you, Jethro. Well, Jane to you, too. Oh. <laughs> Duke and me's all set to go hunting, ain't we, Duke? Jethro, have you ever hunted in the desert? No, ma'am. No, oh, it's a fascinating place. You might even see a mirage. If there's one there, old Duke will treat it. He's the best hunting dog there is. Well, they love hunting around Palm Springs. You'll, you'll all love Palm Springs. They have wonderful hotels. Have you ever stayed in a beautiful hotel suite? 
No, I ain't, darling. <laughs> Granny, let's you and me go and leave these two lovebirds alone. And wait, please, let me take you all to Palm Springs. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you take Jethro and Ellie Mae and me and Granny will stay here? Well, but then Mrs. Dreiser would see. I mean... Is Dreiser coming home? Is that why you was trying to get us out of town so we wouldn't meet her? Yes, that is the reason. I'm so ashamed I could die. Yeah, well, now, don't go to crying about it. The way I look at it, ain't nobody got a right to be ashamed of nobody else. Good Lord made us all, and if we's good enough for him, we sure ought to be good enough for each other. <laughs> I hold back on them tears. Use among friends. <laughs> well, I remember a long time ago hearing a fellow say it. He said, just about right. He said, there is so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it don't hardly, uh, it don't hardly... <laughs> well, go ahead and ball. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> I'll tell you what. If this means so much to you, we'll all pick up and go to them Palm Springs with you. Oh, oh, bless you. Mr. Drysdale will be so happy. I don't want Billy May Park. I'm telling you that Miss Drysdale must be a mess. <laughs> She's gonna need our help, kid. This is a poor time for us to be leaving. Yeah, we well, gotta help her once we get back. Right now, we gotta respect Mr. Drysdale's feelings. Jethro, you go get the truck ready. Okay, Uncle Jed. Foxes ain't worth shooting at. 